This is a lesson on conservation of energy in the work and energy unit. This is following several lessons that I've given on the idea of energy, uh, the work energy theorem, which you see here, the work energy theorem. Uh, I just covered potential energy and relating it to conservative forces. And I wanted to marry all of these ideas together for you because I find that this is a fundamental concept that you are expected to know, the work energy theorem. But often it is not a useful equation considering all the things that you need to keep in account and the identities going on. And what I wanted to do was just kind of develop this equation down here, which I'm going to recommend you use, and you can see where it comes from. So when I think about the network done by a system, I know that the network can be divided up into work done by conservative forces and work done by non-conservative forces. And that will equal the change in the kinetic energy still, right? Has to. Well, I can think about the work done by conservative forces instead with their change in potential energy. We saw potential energy is way easier to think about than calculating a force and a distance and an angle between them. Just think about energy of position as an initial and final. So I'm going to put that in here, negative change in potential energy plus work non-conservative equals the change in the kinetic energy. Okay, so I've started with the work energy theorem. I'm just putting in these identities that I know, these reconceptualizations of the quantities. I'm going to divide these quantities up. A change is always a final minus initial. So I'm going to go negative potential energy final minus potential energy initial plus work non-conservative equals kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather the initials together. Here's the initial term. Here's an initial term. And I'm going to gather the finals together. Here's a final term and here's a final term. And I'm going to take care of this negative sign. Here's a negative sign here. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to distribute that negative to both the potential energy terms. So I get a negative potential energy final and a positive potential energy initial. When I gather the potential energy in initial and kinetic energy initial, this comes over to this side, it becomes a positive. So I get, um, and you can see in the equation down here, kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial. All right, I'm gathering my initial terms together. The non-conservative, the work non-conservative term is still there. And then I'm going to move this final potential energy over to the other side. It's a negative here, so it'll become a positive on the other side. And you can see where the equation down at the bottom comes from the kinetic energy, the work kinetic energy theorem. This is what we call the work kinetic energy theorem. And I've kind of rearranged it. And I recommend students use this equation rather than this equation. This equation is hard and fumbly to use, I find, for students through the years. When I write all of this stuff out in this equation form, and this will be an equation that I give on an equation sheet, when I write all this stuff out, it's easier to keep track of everything going on in a problem, and the initial and final states become a little bit more apparent, what things I need to quantify in the initial state and what things I need to quantify in the final state. I have to identify energies of motion and energies of position. I also need to identify any non-conservative work done by forces in between those two positions, right? Because it is path dependent. I have to take the path into account from initial to final if I have non-conservative work. But it makes my calculation a lot more easier, the setting up the equation for the problem a lot easier. And what I wanted to point out here is conceptually, when I look at this equation, all right, there's an initial energy state, right? The initial kinetic energy and initial potential energy, there's an initial energy state. There's a final energy state. There's a final kinetic energy and a final potential energy. There's two states. So I'm really supporting you thinking in terms, what's the initial state? What's the final state? And that non-conservative term in the center represents any energy in or out of the system by non-conservative forces. Things that we can't take into account in kinetic and potential energy in the initial final state. Things, friction does work between these two points. I have to do a path-dependent consideration of energy in or out because of that. 
So this equation can be conceptualized in this way, and you can structure your problem solving around identifying initial state, final state, and any energy in or out of the system in between. And this is going to work forward when we move to um, electricity, magnetism, uh, heat, uh, where we have heat in or out of the system, there's going to be initial energy state, a final energy state, usually temperatures, right? There's an initial temperature, heat gets added or taken away, and there's a final temperature. So this larger concept of conservation of energy, how am I keeping track of energy that it began with, whatever entered into the system, and then what it left right or what's left over after those things it's a like a checking account I have some sort of initial amount I add or take away throughout the month and then I have a final value and so to me it's an intuitive way of thinking about conservation of energy conservation of mechanical energy and this is the technical term that I was talking about before conservation of mechanical energy is when we get rid of the non-conservative forces non-conservative forces don't contribute mechanical energy is defined as kinetic energy plus potential energy so this when they talk about conservation of energy this is more of the um, general physics type of concept that they're looking at where we're not we're just looking at initial and final potential and kinetic energy not any non-conservative forces there may be some there which is why I give you the whole equation this is important to take into account any energy in or out of the system if it happens to be there so, so let's look at an example the toy block track example Maria set up a simple toy track for her toy block. Okay. The track consists of an arbitrarily shaped curve. Makes sense. If we have path independent stuff, the shape is arbitrary. We don't care what it looks like. Which turns perfectly horizontal at the bottom of the curve when it meets the floor. She holds the block at the top of the track, 0.54 meters above the bottom, and releases it from rust. Let's draw a picture here to get encode sort of what's going on. Identify an initial and final position. We need an initial and final. You're seeing that. Initial energy state, final energy state. So let's get a picture. Um, let's see. I'm going to start out here. Um, there's some sort of arbitrarily shaped track. And then it gets down to the bottom where it's horizontal. Okay, so that will be horizontal. Um, it starts up here. Here's the initial spot. Um, and I will put it up here. Here's her toy block. It goes along this track. Don't ask me how, but it will. Um, and so that's the initial spot. Down here is the final spot. So I have assigned my initial and final for the situation. You can put in here, let's put in here a coordinate system. We need a coordinate system. Y equals zero here so that there is a Y initial, 0 0.54 meters, and Y final equals zero. I'm going to assume actually it says it starts she holds the block at the top and releases it from rust so we know V initial equals zero and V final equals some value I assume that it's going to gain some energy right it moves in the gravitational field it moves downward in the gravitational field so whatever potential energy it started with will transform into another form of energy at the bottom. So you see conservation of energy, we're thinking about this transformation of energy. What were the initial forms? How did those transform into another form of energy at in another state? Okay, so there's that. I think that's good for a sketch. I'm going to read the problem and the question here and see if I need to add anything more. Neglecting friction. Okay, frictionless track. What is the speed of the block when it reaches the bottom of the curve? The beginning of the horizontal of the section of the track. So it seems like this horizontal section of the track, there's going to be friction down here. But they just want, we're looking from this position to this position here. And I'll call this maybe position A and position B. It sounds like there's a position C down here that we have to consider. So part A, uh... I'm going to write out the equation kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial plus work non-conservative equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. 
Some of these terms may be zero and I expect them to be zero. The initial kinetic energy, definitely zero, right? The initial velocity is zero. There's no initial kinetic energy. Potential energy initial. Yes, there is a potential energy initial. I'm going to call this MGY initial. From point A to B, so remember we're going from point A to point B. From A to B, is there any non-conservative forces? And the answer is zero. There's friction from B to C, but from A to B, there's no non-conservative forces. Okay, so that's that side of the equation. Many terms may be zero when you fill this out, and that's fine. You remembered them at least. I'd hate to have zero and remember it, then have a non-zero value and forget it. Is there a final kinetic energy? Yes, that's the thing we're trying to solve for. One half mv final squared. Is there a final potential energy? Well, down at the bottom of the track, it's reached zero position, and so there's zero final poten potential energy. Interestingly enough, I look in here and I see mass. Mass cancels on both sides, and that's fine because there's no mass for the block given in the problem. There's mass canceling on both sides. I'm going to solve this for V final. V final equals, we'll move the half over, I get a 2 G Y initial, and then I'm going to have to square root it, right, because it's squared there. So I get 2 times 9.8 times 0.54 and then square root it and I'm going to get probably 3 point something. And when you run this through your calculator you get 3.2533 meters per second. And you may even call that V final B, right? This is V final at point B, at point B. Okay, so there's the answer for part A. Find the velocity of the block at the bottom of the curve. It says the block comes to rest after traveling along the horizontal of the track, part of the track, 0.75. So we're going to notice down here that we have a distance that the block goes over. There's some sort of initial velocity at B, and then at some point later, C, V final C equals zero. It comes to rest after that, okay? So we have this second final position. And if you remember when I talked about this in the state functions and conservation laws lesson, I said you could choose B to be an initial position and C to be a final position, but the easiest thing to do is just to consider A to be your initial throughout the problem. So what I'm going to do, it says what is the coefficient of friction? Okay, so I'm going to set up my equation again kinetic energy initial plus potential energy initial plus work non-conservative equals kinetic energy final plus potential energy final. And I'm going to let initial be at point A and the final be at point C. I'm not even going to worry about whatever is going on at B. I don't even care about. I know we can solve for it, but I'm just going to let it go. I'm just going to fill in what I know at point A and fill in what I know at point C. Well, I already filled in what I know at point A. At point A, it's not moving, so it has zero kinetic energy. And it also has some potential energy, mg, y, initial. The non-conservative work is going to be the work done by the friction force. Remember, friction force is a non-conservative force, so friction will be doing work, taking energy away from the system over this rough patch here. When I get to the rough patch, that's my final final, right? This is final two as opposed to final one. Final two, final one. So part C, when I get to the end of the track here along the horizontal, it's come to rest, zero, and it has no potential energy. It's not, in, it's at zero in my coordinate system, so it has no potential energy. So again, a lot of these terms are zero. I'm fine with that. Um, I'm trying to solve for something in the work done by the friction force term. Um, I'm going to note that the work done by the friction force has to be equal to the friction force times the distance cosine of the angle between the friction force and the displacement. So the friction force is, um, when I look along the track, the friction force is in the opposite direction of the motion. 
and the displacement is in this direction and I can see that that angle between the friction force and the displacement vector is going to be 180 degrees which introduces a negative sign which I'm happy about because you can't take a positive value and add a positive value and get zero so there needs to be a negative sign somewhere in there right so I'm gonna fill in what I know the friction force is going to be mu k times the normal force and when I do a free body diagram, and I haven't done this yet, it wasn't expected for this problem, but it does help. Um, so when it's sliding along, it has a normal force, a weight, and the friction force, which is a kinetic. So we see the normal force equals the weight, and so the friction force is mu k times mg. And that's what I can plug in here. And I'm going to collect all of this stuff together. Um, let's see. mg y final equals the work done by the friction force and I'm going to plug all this stuff in here um, mu k times mg that's the friction force times the distance times cosine 180 which is negative 1 oh and I need a negative sign right I need to subtract to both sides so this is a negative so I'm getting the negative of a negative Right, this is a negative value here, so I get the negative and a negative. It should turn out to be a positive value. Your sign should match up here. I'm going to solve for mu k. Mu k equals, okay, um, m's cancel on both sides. Oop, there they go. Uh, and so mu k, oh, the g cancels as well. Do you see that? G cancels as well. So I'm going to get y initial divided by D. Very elegant. Very nice. Mg's cancel on both sides. The negatives cancel each other out. I get y equals mu k times d, and then I can solve for mu k. So y initial I know is 0 0.54. The distance that it takes to stop on the horizontal portion of the track is 0.75. And when you run this through your calculator, you get a nice... Um, exact value of 0.72 and that is the coefficient of kinetic friction that's how you work it into that's how you work non-conservative forces into this equation is you can put the work done by the force and because it is a contact force we need to know the value of that contact force and we need to consider how far it was acting over and that's why it's non-conservative right so you can just put that term in there Another problem I've chosen to look at for conservation of energy here using this equation is the Atwood machine, which I looked at the initial and final states for this in the conservation laws and state functions lesson. Two blocks are connected over a frictionless massless pulley, so we don't have to worry about any energy there. There's a three kilogram mass down at the bottom and there's a seven kilogram mass up here. This system will naturally rotate because this is a heavier block. This will fall down to the floor and this block will rise up. And notice that we have a system of objects. That's why I chose this problem is because there is a system here. I have to take two things into account. And how do you do that with conservation of energy? So this is the example. I can note that um, this is the initial position when they're in this right initial position here and here. Uh, let's get a final position going. This block rises up in the gravitational field and this block goes down in the gravitational field. And so this is the final position. In the initial position, I'm going to note that V initial for both of them, V initial 1 equals V initial 2, which is 0. They both start at rest. After this, they have fall, this one's fallen and this one's going up afterwards, they're both moving. And they're connected by a string. So I can know that the final speed of the one will be equal to the final speed of the other. And I don't know what that is. It's not given. Is it given? The speed of the second block when it hits the floor is 2.3 meters. So 2.3 meters per second. It says that down here. I didn't read all the way through. But it, it says that there's a final speed, initial speed, and those are equal for the two blocks because they're connected with a string. 
um, an unknown height above the ground. So we don't know h in this situation, the speed of the second block. Solve for the unknown height. Okay, so I've uncoded the problem. I'm thinking about initial and final states. Uh, is there any non-conservative forces in here? Well, that would be maybe a friction force, an applied force. The tension is definitely a non-conservative force, but when I look at the system, there's no external tension on it. This is an, an internal. Whatever tension is upward here, it's upward here, and it kind of balances out in the system of the blocks. So there's no non-conservative forces acting on the entire system. So I'm going to write out my equation here, kinetic energy initial plus potential. And you can see when I write all this stuff out, it helps me keep track of all these terms that I might forget on my own if I don't have some sort of structure. So initial kinetic energy, nope. Neither of them are mov moving to begin with, right? Initial kinetic energy is zero. Is there initial initial potential energy? When I think about the blue initial position, the and I set, let's set the coordinate system y equals zero down here, there is an initial potential energy. Y initial two equals seven meters, right? So I can put m2g times the seven above the ground. Is there non-conservative work? No. Is there a final kinetic energy? Yes, both of them are moving. M1, V final squared, plus M2, one half, M2, V final squared. They're both moving, they both have a kinetic energy term. We can combine these in a second, but I'm putting them in separately. Is there a final potential energy? Yes, you may forget about it, but remember this smaller block moved upward in the gravitational field, so why? final one equals seven. So I have to remember to put in a potential energy in here. One half m1, remember m1 rows in the gravitational field, seven meters. So, so let's collect some terms together. I'm trying to find h. Okay, so let's fill out this equation. And as I wrote out this equation, I realized that we need a reference for potential energy. We need to assign zero. So let's let the ground equal zero. And we're going to note that um, y 2 initial equals whatever this h value is that we're trying to find. It starts above the ground. This one starts on the ground, but the second one starts above the ground. After, in the final position, this one's on the ground, but the smaller one is moved up, so I'll say y final 1 equals this h, right? So both, there is potential energy to begin with, potential energy to end with, but it's the two s different blocks from initial to final. So let's write, let's fill this in. The initial kinetic energy we know is zero. They both start at rest. The initial potential energy I just identified, the second block is a distance above the ground. So I'm going to put M2GH. I don't know H, so I'll just put that in. We identified that there's no non-conservative forces acting on the entire system, so I can put a zero in here. There's final kinetic energy. Both of them are moving, so I'm going to put in a kinetic energy term for m1, v final squared, and m2, v final squared. They're both moving. They both get a kinetic energy term. If they had two separate speeds, um, the, I could accommodate that. I'm going to combine these terms in a second because they do have the same final speed, um, but I'll leave that for a second. The final potential energy, notice that the this smaller block, sometimes you'd forget about this, but the smaller block has moved up in the gravitational field in the final position, and so it gained a potential energy of m1gh. 
Okay, so I've set up this equation. I can see the term that I'm trying to solve for is the h term. So I'm going to gather all of the h terms on one side and everything else on the other. So I get m2gh minus m1gh. Over on the other side, I'm going to simplify this and notice that I can factor out a half m, a half uh, or the v final squared, a half v final squared out of both of them, a half v final squared, and then I get the two masses adding together, m1 plus m2, right? They have the same f speeds and the same half, and the masses are left over. Uh, I can um, factor out uh, m2, uh, let's do a gh out of there. Um, m2 minus m1 equals 1 half v final squared m1 plus m2. I'm still going for h by itself on one side and everything else on the other. So I'm going to get a v final squared m1 plus m2. And you can leave the half up top there. I'm going to move it down to the bottom to say 2g m2 minus m1. And we can plug in values. Uh, v final, we're given as 2.3 quantity squared. Right? 2.3 is in here. M1 plus M2 is 3 plus 7. Uh, we have 2 times 9.8. And then the mass is subtracted, 7 minus 3. Well, we have a 10 on top and a 4 on the bottom. When you plug these numbers through your calculator, when you do evaluate that, you're going to get H equals 0. 6747. I kept a bunch of sig figs. I don't know why, but that will be the answer. And that's how you include a system of objects. And just to highlight in here, I had a kinetic energy term separate for each of them. They each get their own separate kinetic energy term. So when you have a system of objects, multiple things going on, each of them gets their own kinetic energy term. Each of them gets their own potential energy term. Did you notice that? This has its own potential energy term, and this has its own potential energy term. So I can put all of those terms into one equation for multiple objects as long as that's what I'm defining my system to be. And remember when I first introduced this idea that we're looking at the non-conservative forces on the entire system. And there's no net conserv non-conservative force on the entire system. It's within, there's one within, but it's an internal force. There's no external non-conservative force on this system. So uh, I don't have to take that into account when I set up the equation. It's zero. There's some really interesting applications that come for conservation of energy where we take into account an initial energy state, a final energy state, and energy in or out. So for instance, with the photoelectric effect, we have a photon coming in. There's an initial potential energy and then a final sort of kinetic energy when that photon absorbs the, or that, that electron absorbs the photon, it gets energy in, and it gets freed from the surface and has some sort of kinetic energy. So we're watching how that energy is comes in and is transformed in some way to a final energy state. Chemical reactions with a chemical potential energy or heat in or out, that's a good um, application of conservation of energy. Heat engines so useful. There's so many heat engines. Your refrigerator, your car, your electricity for your house. All of these are heat engines. Bioelectric potentials like in your nerves. Voltage differences across cell membranes. We have sodium carriers and, and um, 